But right now, I have a very, very special guest to talk to me about the Jessica Chambers case. Criminal defense attorney Ron Kuby. Ron, it's great to see you and welcome to Long Crime. Well, thank you so much, Jesse, and it's great to see you again because, in full disclosure, we used to work together on the radio I know. years ago. So it's just a pleasure to see you, and I'm so glad uh, you're doing this incredibly important and, and interesting coverage that has been missing for so long. Well, I appreciate that. That's what we do here at Long Crime. We're happy to bring these trials, especially a case like this. And you can already tell Ron's radio voice is fantastic, so he's going to really resonate here. Yeah, just close your eyes. <laughs> yeah, no one, no one look. No, no, no one look. Don't look at the face. Okay, I've got to ask you the main question here. This is a retrial. We have saw it the first time we covered it. Let's start with the prosecution. They didn't get the verdict that they wanted. What do they have to do differently this time around to secure that guilty verdict against Quinton Tellis? Well, it, it, it's hard to know what they have to do, but it's easy to see what they are doing. Uh, where the case foundered last time was on the witnesses, first responder witnesses who repeatedly said that, that Ms. Chambers uttered the word Eric or Derek as the perpetrator of the crime. They said that repeatedly. Mr. Tellus is not named Eric. It's not his nickname. So, and, and that's where the reasonable doubt reposed last time. So this time what the prosecution has done is uh, they've called a pathologist to testify. It's impossible mm -hmm. for any of these first responders to have heard what they heard because she couldn't speak. So the one question is, are you going to believe a pathologist who really doesn't have any experience with this. And when was the last time she examined somebody's speech who had burned, been burned over 98% of her body? Or are you going to believe all of the first responders? The second thing the prosecutor tried to do in this case, at least according to published reports, is they went to some jailhouse snitch mm -hmm. where Mr. Tellis is being held on other matters that the jury won't hear about, and they tried to get him to say that Tellus's nickname was Eric. Right. Right? And that solves their problem. Yeah, it involves perjury, and yeah, it involves a wholesale manufacture of evidence, but the prosecution isn't looking for truth in this case. Prosecution believes they know the truth. They know the truth, they're convinced of the truth, and the prosecution is attempting to prove their version of the truth. If they can overcome the Eric barrier, um, they have a pretty good chance uh, of convicting Tellus based on a wide variety of circumstantial evidence. Yeah, that seemed to be the main issue in the first trial around, but you made a good point. This speech pathologist wasn't there, and how can you really interpret what this young 19-year-old girl was going through and what was, was she trying to say? But let's play a little bit of the prosecution's opening statement in case you missed it, which provides a narrative and groundwork for where they are going to go in this case. This is from yesterday. Take a look. That's Darla Palmer, one of the defense attorneys for Quentin Tellis, making some pretty strong points in that opening statement. Back here with Ron Kuby, I can't help but think about what she just said, and it's resonating with me that, yes, you, you mentioned it earlier, you can have a speech pathologist come on and say, it's impossible for Jessica Chambers to say what she said, but when multiple first responders were leaning right in there, how could you deny what they heard? Well, that's right. And, and let, let's try a thought experiment. Let's pretend that Quentin Tellis's first name actually was Eric. Mm -hmm. What do you think the prosecution would be saying? The prosecution would be out there saying, she spoke her last words were to name Eric Tellis as her killer. Do you think they'd be having a speech pathologist on saying, no, oh, no, no, that's impossible, medically can't happen. They would be promoting that testimony. So again, this is why from the prosecution's perspective, it's not about the truth, it's about proving the truth that you've already decided, and that's always dangerous, especially in racially fraught cases like this. Take the motive, for right. example. There's no motive in this case, so the prosecution had to make one up. And what was the motive they made up? Well, that he wanted to have sex with Yeah, her. of course, that's what every black man in Mississippi wants to do with the white girl, right? I mean, it is incredibly fraught with racist and racial overtones going back a hundred years. Of all the motives you could make up, and that's what they are doing because they don't have any evidence of motive, they decided to make up that one. And in other words, as you said in our break, him not being truthful to investigators, 
he's in a dangerous predicament. Think about the circumstances of where he is. And you have a, a substantially African-American jury. They're not going to wonder too hard why it is that when you are a young black man and the white woman that you were with a little while ago turns up dead, why, why would you possibly want to place yourself as far away from her as possible? Just think of the history of this. And, and the defense doesn't have to prove that. The defense can just explain it in closing argument, and that's what they're going to do. Okay. Well, the prosecution has some points that they want to make as well. And when we get back from our next break, we're going to play you some testimony from the first day, which will give an indication of the timeline. When was Quentin Tellis with Jessica Chambers? Because that becomes key. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. All right, we're going to talk more about that in a second. Remember, we're going to be live in that courtroom at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Do want to let our viewers know that at the top of the program, I mentioned we're also covering a new case out of Florida, the Melanie Eam case, this young woman who's on trial for allegedly stabbing her 21-year-old ex-boyfriend to death. Pretty horrific stuff. If you want to go to follow that case, go to longcrime.com. Uh, that's the live feed right now. Obviously, trial hasn't started quite yet, but if you want to see, go there. We're going to focus right now on Jessica Chambers, uh, back here with Ron Kuby. We talked about this uh, at the, before, that yes, maybe he, Quentin Tellis had an incentive to lie, maybe there's some problems in uh, this pathologist, but one of the issues is where he actually was that night. Can you speak more about that? Yeah, and that's sort of a problem that the defense has, and it's, it's a new problem for them based on the data that were downloaded in between the two trials. It's one thing to explain away why you lied to the police, but the fact that you were with the dead person a half hour before she got made dead is a really bad fact for the defense. I mean, ideally, as a defense lawyer, you want your client to have been as far away as humanly possible from the dead person when the dead person was killed. You want your client in a different time zone or a different country. You don't want the two of them together at 7 uh, p.m when she was burned to death just a half an hour later. Yeah, that's not the best thing not for your a good uh, client. Uh, let's play a little bit more of Keisha Meyer. We'll learn a little bit more about Jessica Chambers and her relationship with Quentin Tellis. Take a look. Oh. All right, so that was Keisha Meyer, the best friend of Jessica Chambers. And one of the things that the defense was getting out of her is that Jessica Chambers was kind of involved in the drug trade, which becomes an interesting avenue to explore. Ron, is that dangerous? I mean, this young 19-year-old girl was burned alive, and we're getting questions that about her selling drugs. Now, is that a good thing to do if you're the defense attorney? It's something the defense has to do, because you have an Eric out there at you, that you're portraying as the guilty party, and a lot of evidence to support that. Well, what is Eric's motive for killing her? Well, one very plausible motive for killing her, especially in the way that she was killed, was a dispute over a drug deal. We've all watched enough movies of drug dealers burning people alive and doing other horrible things that, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. That's the kind of thing somebody might do if they had been ripped off or perceived themselves to be ripped off or uh, uh, dealing with a competitor in a drug transaction. So, you know, first you have Eric, unknown. Now you've got a motive for Eric to have killed her. So you kind of have to do it. As opposed to having a guy who was kind of dating her and wanted to have sex, it doesn't quite work. My, the thing that I saw in the first trial, what I'm seeing here, and it, it gets to me, is was there a thorough enough investigation into other Eric's or Derek's? And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. You know, there was a thorough investigation. Um, they didn't find the other Eric's or Derek's, although they did find Quentin's sister, yes. who has a tat that says Eric mm -hmm. on her shoulder, Eric being her ex-boyfriend. Now the police, and, and that would strike me as a place to go, the police say they cleared him. I don't know the basis by which they made that assertion, but it is an assertion that they've made. Yeah, and I don't know what that means to clear him. Right. It was a conversation that we had the first trial around 
we're going to have the same conversation this time around. How was he cleared? There's a I, video of him right. in another place, or he has three friends say he was with them? This isn't or, CSI. In the first 20 minutes, we know what how they cleared somebody. Yeah, so exactly. we're, we're going to have to see. And that when the investigators come on, that is definitely a crucial point. Now, again, we will be live in that courtroom in maybe 15, 20 minutes, so stay here on Law & Crime. We are going to take a quick break. We will be right back. A lot more to discuss. This is what we expected. We expected the first responders from the first case to testify again. And you can imagine, I remember seeing him the first time around, how emotional this got, trying to explain the image of seeing a burnt Jessica Chambers walking towards you. It's pretty incredible to hear this testimony, and we're going to continue to hear it as the trial progresses. Uh, but I'm back here with Ron Kuby to talk more about the details of the case as we wait for the live feed any moment in this trial. Um, we talked about all the ways, the, the maybe there's reasonable doubt here, right? Maybe there's reasonable doubt with Quentin Tellis. But there's one thing that we know and what the viewers know that the jury might not know, or at least we hope they not, not, might, don't know. Quentin Tellis is in trouble with the law. This is not his only case. Can you elaborate on that? It's not his only murder. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to have had trouble with the law. He's doing time right now for burglary. Okay, fine. But he's charged with another murder of another woman in another state. Now, the jury should not hear that, because if the jury did hear that, they'd say naturally he's guilty, and, and you don't want people convicted based on the jury's perception they're bad people rather than the evidence as to whether they did it or not. But as citizens, we can look at that and say, you know, innocent people do get charged with murder, although most people go their whole lives uh, without being charged falsely well, you with murder. So, at least. Yeah, I mean, most people, but, but I've done a lot of wrongful conviction cases right? Um, where innocent people have actually been convicted. But I've never seen a case where an innocent person is separately charged with two different murders in two different states. I'm sure that it's happened because in an infinite universe, everything has happened or will happen, but it is very, very rare. Yeah, what Ron is speaking to is that he is charged with uh, murdering a student, a 34-year-old. Uh, it was charged because he had unlawful use of this uh, student's credit card, um, and she was stabbed to death back in Louisiana in 2015. So this coincidence of two separate murders for, regarding the same individual is pretty incredible. But focusing now on the uh, first responders, we are going to cover more of that uh, when we get back from our break. There is so much to discuss in this case. And again, we expect a live feed any moment here on Law & Crime. You're not going to want to miss any second of this trial. Now, when we come back, we are going to talk more about it. But in the meantime, right now is a short preview of an upcoming special discussing the Jessica Chambers case. So take a look at this. We'll be right back. Stay tuned here on Law & Crime. All right, everybody. So that was Melissa Rogers, again, one of the first people to be there after Jessica Chambers was burned alive. Back here with Ron Kuby. I'm not sure what I'm getting from this. The fact that she personally didn't hear what Jessica Chambers had to say, how impactful is that? Uh, it doesn't really mean much of anything. Uh, you know, it's like, okay, a lot of people didn't hear it. But the fact that a lot of people didn't hear it doesn't uh, attack the credibility of those people who did. And, and remember, again, what the prosecution is doing. These are volunteer firefighters. These are first responders. These are people who the state trusts to run in to a burning building and rescue their children. These are the people the state trusts uh, to take care of their fellow human beings, and they're they're attacking their credibility. And we talked a little about it a little bit before in the break, and we're going to talk about it on the upside, is this uh, crime scene reconstruction, when they actually go to the crime scene and try to understand how it all went down. It, you had said earlier that it's a way to uh, combat the credibility of these witnesses. We'll talk more about that in a minute. We have to go to a quick break. When we come back, we'll be live back in Jessica Chambers. Stay tuned. Well, this is what you're going to hear today, the first responders explaining what they saw. And this is not easy for anyone to hear, let alone the family of Jessica Chambers. You saw them getting very emotional during the course of this testimony. Uh, Ron Kuby, I, unfortunately, our time together is coming to a close. That's so, so sad. It is sad, but I want to ask you a final question about that. We're, we're learning the details of what happened to Jessica Chambers, and we talked a little about it. Is there any benefit, any value to the jurors seeing photos of what happened to her? 
There, there isn't, uh, except for the sheer emotional impact. Now, what the prosecution is arguing, the basis for their admissibility, uh, is to create this overall impression that the first responders, the firefighters, the people whose job it is to see the worst things and to be the most heroic people are all wrong. They were too traumatized, it was too loud, they didn't hear what they heard, they didn't you know, uh, uh, hear what they said they heard. Uh, so the whole beginning of the case is an attack on the very witnesses that usually are the strongest witnesses for the prosecution. It is a very defensive way to begin a murder prosecution. Yeah, and we're going to have to see which way it goes. Ron, thank you so much for coming on. We can't wait to have you back. Yeah, yeah, it's great to see you again. As we said earlier in the segment, you and I go back to the radio days, but I have a face for radio, <laughs> and you, my friend, do not. I don't know, man, I appreciate it. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned here on Long Crime.